we're talking today about one man, one journey, and I guess when you look at that, you could probably go, oh, well, he's going to talk about some magnificent man who went on an epic journey of overcoming you. It could have been Scott in his failed trip to the South Pole or Mawson and all of his Antarctic adventures, but I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm instead I'm going to talk about one man's journey with God. Um, and this is as outlined by him. And I'm going to look at three different pieces of writing that he has constructed to show these three different phases of the journey that he went through. You know, all of us have a journey with God. And each of us would be able to tell a different story about that journey. Uh, they would all have similarities. There would be ups and there would be downs. They would, they would be those. But it's our journey. It's our story. And the man I'm going to talk about, as you probably can tell from the, the fact that it's from the book of Psalms, is, is David. David... Um, I want to look at his journey with God and, and, and the, the, the different phases that he went through. And hopefully at the end of it, you'll see that he came to a place where, where he was comfortable in God and where he had this absolute trust in God. Um, and, and he was at peace with who he was and who God was. Now, there was one author who once wrote about David. He said this about David. It would be a really good idea if I turned that on. He didn't actually write that, I just said that to myself. David wrote this, no, and this is what was written about David, sorry, no Bible character more fully illustrates the moral range of human nature. And it's true, you know, I look at the story of David and I go, wow. He, he lived life to the full. He was a man who, who went through all these different experiences. He, he, he went through everything that I've experienced. And I guess he's in the Bible for that reason. That reason is there so that we can learn from David. And the first psalm I want to look at today is the psalm that Lindsay looked at. And this is a psalm of, of praise and gratitude and grace. And I'm not going to read it all like Lindsay did. I'm just going to look at certain verses as we go through it. And the first one I'll look at is verse 21. I mean, verse 1, sorry, of, chapter, of Psalm 21. The king rejoices in your strength, Lord. How great... In, is his joy in the victories you give. You know, the first thing I noticed about this was the fact that David is writing about himself in the third person. He's the king. And he's writing about himself in this way. But look at what he's saying here. He's saying the king rejoices. And if, oh, you may notice that I put a little bit of a, my own emphasis in that text there. The re king rejoices in your strength, Lord. How great is the joy in the victories you give. And it's all about God. You can imagine that David's on an absolute high here at the moment, isn't he? He's on one of those mountaintop experiences that we all experience where just praise seems to come really easy from his lips and relationship with God is just a great thing. And he's sitting there going, Lord, you know, it's all because of you. I achieve all of this because of your strength. I'm in this position because of the victories you give. I owe it all to you. He has joy in your victory. David acknowledges that it's all about God. He goes on in verse 2 to say this, You have granted him his heart's desire and not have, have not withheld the request of his lips. You know, sometimes you hear people going, you, know, you, you pray for something or you ask for something and people go, oh no, you can't have that. You, know, you can't ask God for that. God only gives you what you need. And yet here's David, he's saying, you have granted him his heart's desire, his heart's desire. What is your heart's desire? What is your heart's desire today? Now, some people will go, oh, well, you've got to ask in, in relationship to what God wants, of course. Of course you do. If you're in a relationship with God, if you're growing with God daily, your heart's desire is going to reflect more and more what God's heart's desire is. If you're going to ask for something that is, that is evil, that is, is just selfish to the, to the max, then you're not going to get it. You're not really asking for something that is from God's heart because that's what we're doing it. And David is asking his heart's desire, but it's to do with God's heart. And God has given him, granted him his heart's desire, and he has not withheld the requests of his lips. He's a generous God. God is a generous God. Have you ever stopped to contemplate how generous God really is? He is a generous God. He gives us our heart's desire. He gives us the request of our lips. 
As we enter into that walk with him, our heart's desire will reflect his heart's desire and he will give it to you. In in verse 3, he says, You came to greet him with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold on his head. You know, I couldn't help but think of the imagery of of the prodigal son. Yeah, while the son was still a long way off, the father saw him and and came running to him to give to him the the acceptance back into the family. And and David has found this with God. He says, you come to greet me or him with rich blessings. Has God greeted you with rich blessings this year? It's his joy. God enjoys bringing good things into his children's life. Remember what what Jesus said when he says, you know, ask and it shall be given to you. He says, you know, what father, if their son is going to ask for a loaf of bread, will give him a snake? Maybe the Pratts would, I don't know. You want a loaf of bread? Here, have a boa constrictor. Normally the, the answer would be none. And Jesus said, well, how much more so is God wanting to give you good things? God is a generous God. He will greet you with rich blessings. And David goes on to say, and he puts this crown of pure gold on my head. I don't think he's actually talking about the literal reign of Israel. here. I think he's thinking of greater things. I'm an heir and I'm a co-heir with Jesus Christ. I am a victorious person. I have the crown of rulership and victory on my head and God has placed it there because he is that kind of God. Because of God's love and grace to us. Now the passage continues in the same way, speaking about the blessings that God is wanting to bring into our lives. It talks about length of life. It talks about eternal blessings bestowed on David. It talks about these good things that happen all from God. But then we see a text which emphasises the promise of Scripture, and that's in verse 7 where he says, For the king trusts in the Lord. Through the unfailing love of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Wow, isn't that a, isn't that a powerful text, isn't it, really? I trust in the Most High, therefore I will not be shaken. What, what a statement of faith. What a statement of belief and hope. This, this statement that David makes about God and his goodness and his graciousness. What an experience to have. But you know, it wasn't always that way with David, was it? Because David, as that author said, portrayed the whole range of human feelings. And David wasn't always on this high with God. And if I want to go to another passage of scripture, and it's actually Psalm 22, the very very next psalm. And I want you to have a look at how it starts. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? You know, when I read this, I went, how can the same man be writing these words? The same man who wrote about the highs of Psalm 21, all of a sudden is in a position in Psalm 22, the very next chapter in the book, saying, my God, my God, where are you? Why are you so far? You know, I mean, we, we always think about the closeness of God, don't we? And yet here is David going, using so far twice. Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. Where are you, God? I heard a preacher say recently that it's because David has stopped looking at the promises of God, has stopped looking at the character of God and has started looking at the circumstances that surround him. I like the insight. Because I wonder at times if when we, when we go through those dark periods, it's because we're just inundated with the circumstances of life and we look at the circumstances of life as they're coming to us and the bad things that happen around us and, and we take our, our eye off the prize, so to speak. 
and we look at the competition. It's like the old saying, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees. And when we start looking at the circumstances of life, when we start not looking at God, who, who we are to, to follow, who is to be our, our be-all and our end-all, the one that we give all glory to, and we start taking our eyes off him, then the troubles and circumstances that surround us take our view away from who he is. What else does that verse remind you of? Who, who else spoke those words? Jesus. Jesus, as he hung on the cross, said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How low must David be feeling for him to say exactly the same thing? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm abandoned. You are so far away from me. In verse 2, he goes on to say, My God, I cry out by day, but you, what? Do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. You know, it's, it's probably a, an understatement to say David's in a bad place. Psalm 21, he was on such a high. Psalm 22, he's in this pit where he doesn't believe that God is even answering him anymore, that he's, he's just not even hearing. The circumstances that he's looking at are overwhelming him. He cannot see a way out. He cannot detect God's presence at all. And he goes on in verse 6 to say, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. His spirit of resolve is low. But, you know, as you go through and read the rest of Psalm 22, and I hope you'll do that for a bit of an exercise, go through and look at these three psalms that I'm looking at with you today because I'm just giving them a brief overview. But even in Psalm 22, if you go through and look at Psalm 22, you will still see this, this stubborn under, underlying belief and, and faith that David has. This hope that he, that he has that will, will, you know, God will work it out somehow. I don't see it now. I can't see how this is going to all finish, but God is going to work it out somehow. He goes on in verse 11 to say this, Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. You hear that cry of that plea? Do not be far from me. You are my only help. Do not be far from me. In verse 19 he says this, But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. And even though he's in this dark pit, he's still crying out to the only one he knows that will give him the help that he needs. Don't be far from me, God. He's still crying out to God. It all seems dark, but he's still crying out to God. You know, it's unbelievable that David, a man after God's own heart, could have such enormously different experiences when it comes to God. From the highest of highs where, he, where praise and acknowledgement of God's goodness are so generously on his lips. To the lowest of lows, to the place where he feels alone. But you know what, in all honesty, it probably reflects many of our personal journeys as well. You hear those people talk about that mountaintop experience I mentioned earlier where God feels close and believing and trusting him, and him seems so easy. But then we all have those experiences where we doubt. Is he real? Is it real? Is he really here? And all that seems so easy, all that praise and all that, that goodness that seemed so easy earlier on when we were on that mountaintop experience all of a sudden seems to have been gone. And doubt seemed to rule the way that we operate with God. You know, I believe that the experiences of David in the Bible for us are a lesson. The Bible is our lesson book, isn't it? And David had these highest of highs and these lowest of lows and he shared very willingly his journey. He shared very openly his feelings about God. I mean, you read it and he's talking to God saying, God, where are you? Why do you abandon me? It's okay. To question God sometimes, I believe, David shows it's okay. But he openly shared these, these parts with us as well. And I go, why? 
Why is this in the Bible? And I believe it's in the Bible to give us a, a message. And that message is, even when we doubt, God doesn't give up. There it is. Even when we doubt, God doesn't give up. And that if we journey with God, that if we hang on to God even during those low times when everything else just seems to be falling apart, we will come to a place of rest and understanding just as David did. And the next psalm I want to share with you is, a, is that place, that place where he comes, where he goes. It doesn't depend on, on how I'm feeling. My relationship with God doesn't need for me to be on the highest of highs to know that he's there. My relationship with God, you know, if I'm in a low place, I don't need to doubt that he's not there because I came to a place where I felt good about myself, about my relationship with God. And that's Psalm 23. Isn't it interesting? They're all in a row. And I want to read this with you. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. What does it say in other, other rent translations? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And as you read through that psalm, it's not all good, is it? He's saying God is laying, you know, he leads me beside the still waters. He takes me into the green pastures. He refreshes my soul. There are some good things happening. He's acknowledging that he's having some highs. But then he talks about going through this deepest, darkest valley. But what does he say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what does he say? I will have no fear because I know you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You set a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And there's this balance. David has journeyed through these highest of highs and these lowest of lows, and he's come to this balance in his relationship with God. He says it doesn't depend on how I'm feeling. It doesn't depend on the fact if I'm in a high or on a low. It depends on the goodness and the grace of God. And the goodness and the grace of God dictates that he will always be with me like he promised. When everything else seems to be falling apart, I know that he is with me. You know, David journeyed to a place of understanding and peace. And as we stand at the start of this new year, and it's pretty close now, isn't it? 2016, who would have thought? I remember when I used to think back as a kid going, now how old will I be when it's the year 2000? Now I go, I can't believe I'm in 2016 almost already. But as we stand at the start of this new year, I trust and I pray that our relationship with God will deepen and strengthen this year. You know, if I'm, not a better, if I'm not in a better relationship with God tomorrow than I was yesterday, then I'm not growing. And this year, my, my prayer for each one of us is that we will surrender ourselves to God, that we will seek him, that we will seek his grace and his goodness, that we will come to that place that David did. Where we will know that the circumstances of life don't dictate to us how much God does or doesn't love us. Because God's love is always there. Just because I feel like he's distant doesn't mean that he is. Because his love is always there. 
And so this year, I, 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 this, for this next year, I trust that we will all grow in, in God's grace, that we will come to the place where we find in God our shepherd and our guide, our provider and our source of strength. And even though we walk through some really dark and forbidding times, that we will know that he is still in our life, that he will always be there with us, guiding us. You know, I'm glad that we have the lessons of David's life so clearly outlined in Scripture because it gives me hope knowing that my God is a God who will see me through because of his goodness and his grace. Father, we long for the time when we will dwell with you forever. But we also know that we're in a time where we do dwell with you because you're with us. May, may we be constantly aware of your presence as we walk from this place today. May we operate in the power of our Holy Spirit. And may we just be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ so that we always operate from the strength that you give, I pray in Jesus' name.